I'm not going to do an introduction. I think people are better at introducing themselves. So I could tell you some Piwe is a painter, a sculptor, mixed media artist, that in the art world terms, what did they say? You live between um, Cape Town and Los Angeles. Where is that? The car. <laughs> That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us a bit about yourself. You're a Cape Tonian, firstly. So, um, born in 1990, um, from uh, my mother, my mother was, uh, worked in Johannesburg, and then later moved to uh, Cape Town in the around the um, 1990s. I actually early 2000, so that's the same time when I came this side. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in Eastern Cape, Johannesburg as a child, and then I moved to, to Cape Town. So a lot of my formation years were in this uh, small township called Masipumalele, just, just over this hill, actually. <laughs> um, so there's something about being in the space right now and knowing that like not too long ago I would have had to go all the way to Ezekiel to see an exhibition like this which I actually never never saw but um, yes I, I, I am well, let's go to Masi <laughs> so you can hear me on the microphone yeah. I just check okay so let's go back to pre Michaelis so um, you studied at Michaelis but you were a bit of an older student. How old were you when you started there? So I was, I was 20. 20? Yeah. Okay, but let's roll back maybe two or three years when you were a dancer and there was yeah. a cultural festival in Massey. Let's pick up there. Okay, so I don't know. So this is kind of inconsistent to the story. I guess, I guess we're trying to we, get to specifics. So so. We're going to speak a little bit about um, some Piwe's work and see how it sort of returns to the work that we are surrounded by. Okay. So we're headed towards Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Um, anyhow, uh, so I would say, so like if we go back three years before I was at Michaelis, I went to the French Bay Arts, uh, Arts Center. And so I, w I went to high school in Langa Township, so I would commute from Masi by train, taxi, to the next township in, uh, in Langa because that was the only school that offered, um, that offered art until grade 12. So I was doing design there, and of course, my, um, my art teacher, Oli Swangunzi, was very, very fond of, uh, of uh, George Pemba uh, and, and like a big fan of Gerard Sequato. And of course, all of the jazz music that um, that was in line, that happened um, in her time as well. So, so my my introduction actually to these artists was first and foremost there at at at, at in high school, just just uh, Jared Sicotto and uh, and and George Pember. Do you remember any particular compositions? So there's, there's, of course, one that I painted repetitiously of a mother smoking a pipe. And there's a really, really old one um, at my auntie's house who still remains in Masi. Uh, and she still has it hanging. So I look at it, and it looks like it was painted on like a shirt like mine. <laughs> and it's, of course, like a, a, a reproduction of a, Gerard, of a George Pember painting uh, that I did. I think it must have been like uh, 2007 or so. <clears throat> I mean, when you were a young man, what? when you were looking at Sokoto and looking at George Pember, what, what attracted you to their work? So, I think firstly it was, it was because we didn't have, I didn't have uh, art education for uh, like formal, it, it, actually most of the art education we had when I was in primary school going into high school was, um, it was like a, a lot of Western art. Hmm. So it was like the art movements or realism, abstraction, you know, the, the, um, all of the, I guess, the art historical canons. So discovering, when I discovered uh, through my teacher, when I discovered uh, these two artists, and of course for her exerting her, uh, her, her pas passion, I guess, 
um, of what, why these artists were important, you know, that kind of translated uh, to us. But also, there was something about the fact that they, they painted, uh, you know, things that I, of course, I was like, I identify this is not, you know, truth in the same way that's been claimed um, about these artists, especially uh, Josh Pamba. Uh, they, they were painting from their own imaginations too. There was a lot of trial, um, experimentations, and, and figuring things out, or, or imagination. So there's something about like George Pamba's paintings that attracted me, I think more so than Jared Sokoto's works, because Jared Sokoto's were much more urban, um, and then there was a rural, a rural aspect to George Pember's works that I guess as a naive young artist, you know, immediately, and, and of course I, I, I'm from closer people in the Eastern Cape, even though I, I, I don't have the very traditional uh, Transkai, Siskai, um, you know, very deeply been proud, proud of, right? you know. So already my, my own upbringing was in like, uh, more so in, a, in an urban setting, so like very cradle, yeah. So there isn't, it's not like there's, there's the tribal uh, aesthetic that is that I would see in George's, George Pemper's works or any of the artists that I see here. There it's, it's, it's very, you could see that this was, it's, it's, it's a town that was later formed, Cradle Kofmeyer is a town that was later formed because people were working on um, on roads, they were, you know, my grandfather uh, from my mother's side was building, um, you know, they ended up there because he was going for work doing these roads. So that's how they ended up there. So this, this combination between Kosa and Afrikaans and him getting married to um, a lady who's, you know, from the Karu side of um, Eastern Cape. Anyhow, um, I'm forgetting my train of thought, but... Let's, let's quickly go back. So, Frank Jabert, one of, I, I think at the center, one of the teachers was Peter Clark, right? Yeah. And Peter was a, a so good Peter friend. So, Peter was uh, at the Frank Jabert, when I was at the Frank Jabert, this is bef before they, 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 uh, they had the Frank Jabert named after uh, Peter Clark. When I was there, um, it was under Liesl Hartman. So Liesl is at the Iziko, um, you know, working in education uh, at the Iziko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the Zeitz, not Iziko, at the Zeitz, yes. <laughs> yeah, so she, she was actually one of my, she was my painting teacher. Um, and she was one of the people that really exerted, uh, you know, um, a lot of, not just a, practical side of, of painting, but like there we were, we got to learn a lot more about theory. So, so also, so artists like uh, Ephraim Gatane, um, Ezrom Lagaye, the art centers that were important in, in uh, Rock Strift Art Center, uh, Poly Street, and all of these art centers that were really important in um, the formation or, or or like those spaces that were created around during the apartheid for these artists to find outlets and be trained, uh, <clears throat> which I think is, is, a, is, it forms a lot of, a lot of artists that now we actually are marginalized and not into these conversations predominantly were, went to these schools and had partial, partial uh, training, but not formal in a way that um, is like Michaelis or Overt in, in a way. Um, so there is a question about why those artists in themselves, you know, remain neglected. But uh, Peter Clark also was at, um, what was the one that was in Cape Town? Uh, was it Poly Street? No, no. Great Moor or? No, not Great Moor. But there's one of the art centers that were really. Community Arts Cap Project. Arts yeah, Cap, yeah. yes. So, so, um, so places like Cap, um, you know, became one of the places I learned about from, from Peter when we became friends. So what Peter Clark was um, when I got to Frank Chopin, of course, I first 
learned about his work. And then one time when I was uh, this side in Marcy, I ran into, I, I actually just took my stuff into okay, this so music festival. Okay, so what year are we, so just so we... 2008. This, so 2008, okay. Yeah. So in 2008, I went to this, um, I decided, or actually no, it's through one person who had seen me dance at this music festival, at, at this um, Zanzi festival, it's called. And he told me that, like, the year after, in 2008, that I should take my art and see if I could sell my, my paintings there. He knew, he's, he was a friend of mine from the same township, I guess. Um, so I didn't talk to him about how I would do that. But I ended up taking my cousin, and then I collected all of this work that were, I guess, like some of it I used to sell in the traffic lights, this side. Um, in between my studies in high school. So I would make these, of course, very George Pemba inspired, some of them. Um, and some of them were ex the exotic African portraits, um, if you will, uh, because I could see in town those, those were what the tourists were buying. Anyhow, so I took, I took a collection of these small paintings I was making in between school to this festival and had somebody sit in front of me so I can do their studies. So I was making these, I was generating some cash. I ambushed into this festival. I did, know what, nobody knew I was, like I didn't have permission to be there. I didn't know what were the rules. So anyhow, I set up my store, I started selling this art and a lot of people actually were really buying these works. Um, and then at some point as I was doing this, the studies, I guess, these drawings, these live portraits, um, I saw Peter Clark, I didn't know who he was, and he came, and I was, I was drawing someone who you know, didn't have any facial features that I could identify with and say, you know, this is this person. So I was really ready to have this person go. Um, so eventually, when Peter came, I was like, so in awe, you know, this charismatic man who's, you know, who's got all these things that just from this person I was drawing didn't have. So, and he asked to sit for a portrait. So, and I was excited. So I, I just sat and I drew him uh, up until a crowd gathered. And of course, from then, like somebody whispered and asked if I knew who I was drawing. Um, and I didn't. So he said, you know, this is, this is Peter Clark. A uh, very famous South, South African artist. So this was, this was an encounter with um, someone who actually became my mentor. So from then on, uh, we became friends. He actually was one of the people that sponsored um, my education at the school and pushed me to apply to, to make Helios. Um, and of course, one of the things that he said, because he saw the type of realism, I guess, <laughs> that I had um, without without having been um, taught, yeah, I, I would say I, I, had, I, had, I had some, some art education because I was doing it in school and I, had, I was going to, 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 um, to uh, the French Bay Art Center. I, you know, he, the advice was that don't let the conceptual school change you, um, hold on to that. So that was one of the things that you know, he said, and of course he was talking, he was saying this looking at the paintings I was making at the time. And of course you didn't listen to him. I, yeah, I did, <laughs> I did. I, I mean, I, had, I still had to carve my way out of it. Uh, but I listened to a lot of the stuff. I mean, we, you know, I was, I was with him um, and I learned a lot, I learned a lot about um, South African artists. Uh, Billy Mandindi, he used to talk a lot about Billy. Uh, I mean, you know, one of the reasons I um, asked some people to talk about the story is that the art world's both big and small, and it's, we forget that it's small and intimate and people are connected to each other. So that drawing archive is part of a much bigger archive, and amongst the objects that are in it is uh, a gift from uh, Peter Clark to George Pember. And what's important is not the it's a small gift and it's inscribed, is the date. It's from the, the 80s. 
in the kind of conventional biography of uh, George Pemba, he has an exhibition in 91, a solo exhibition at the Everard Reed, and that functionally introduces him to the larger South African art world. And six years later, he has his uh, retrospective at the National Gallery. But, you know, clearly uh, Peter was aware of him much earlier, and these internal dialogues that go on, and also, I suppose, continuities between generations, which is important. But um, I want to ask a, a question. Like, you know, we're looking at figurative work here. When one looks at your own paintings, you do uh, paint your figures. They're the dominant thing. But color is such a like, vital part of your work. Your exhibition, the first institutional exhibition in the title is a color, yeah. pink. Yeah. And you know, one of the first impressions when you walk around here, if you don't just take a literal view, is this enigmatic sense of color. Um, particularly, I would argue, like amongst some of Trevor McCorber's work, if you come look close at the bioscope of George Pember, color is remarkable. Um, when, when you were looking at George Pember and Sokoto, was color something that interested you, or was it the scenes that they were portraying? Um, so from, from this teacher that uh, in high school who was actually really pivotal in my own understanding of first these artists that we're, we, we have in front of us, she, I guess one of the things that I actually kept um, when it comes to color was that it's about contrast, it's about hot and cold. Um, and then we had to learn what those complementary contrast and contrasting colors and complementary colors were. Um, even if I didn't understand at the time, I think when I later started carving out my own voice, just thinking about hot and cold and making sure that each work that I make has these, um, I guess this is how, it's sort of like a rubric that I, I, I use when I make paintings. Um, I'm obsessed with color. I think there's something about it that, that manipulates the viewer to, or, or draws the viewer to come and look. Um, but there's also a, a distortion that is also outside of reality too. Like this, the colors that are, I mean, if I look at <coughs> George Pembers, you know, they, they're naturalistic in a way, but they, they are really distort, uh, what is it like, uh, they are distortions of, of what reality really looks like. They highlight and they, they push things forward. Um, they, you know, so you could it's sort of like curate how much of the image is seen, how much is, is, is silenced, you know. Um, and I think this is the, the strength you, you one, if I think as a painter, this is sort of the technicalities that I, I, I employ when I think about image making. Um, but yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I would like to make black and white images or monochrome images at some point that are not necessarily about color. If I think about um, William Kendridge, for, in, for instance, and his refusal to use, um, uh, you know, color, it's, 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 it's very interesting to hear his, um, his perspectives on it, too. If we... Um Go to your Michaelis time. Your graduation show caused a lot of interest, or prompted a lot of interest. And one of the central works was the sculptural work, quoting the Raft of Medusa. And in a way, it's about reworking the canon. I mean, you see it in Kehinde Wiley, but you also see it in George Pemba. What was your interest in looking back at these sort of earlier art historical references and tweaking them? Uh, I think, I don't know if I was particularly aware of what the interest really was, but I think I was trying to make connections outside of um, what I wanted to depict. Um, so the piece that you are talking about is the Raft of the Medusa. It's a sculpture that has that is actually was acquired by the um, uh, national by Sang. Okay. Uh, so I'm very happy that you know they were able to keep that piece which I made at art school. You know that 
that by in, in, by itself kind of gave me this this confidence actually um, that okay you know there's support at home you can continue doing what you're doing um, and and this this piece that I I would have not known where where I was gonna keep um, went to this a beautiful institution um, the connections with art history I think I. I was observing from artists who were very influential to me, like Mawande Zenzile, who, you know, was a, a, a voice that was ahead of us, uh, that was prominent. There's a piece that you also uh, wrote, uh, a conversation that you had with him. <laughs> so there's a, an interesting full circle, because um, that's the first time I got to know about you too, from that piece. <laughs> and it was an interesting dialogue that you had. Uh, but the connection with making art historical reference was that I could see that it was not necessarily a, a, like a, a wrong thing or a plagiarism, but you could sort of pick out uh, historical moments and make connections. Um, and art history somehow does these repetitions um, of recalling, re referencing, uh, creating connections, I guess. So I wanted to to do that with pulling out from a historical painting and rendering it in, into something uh, sculptural. And I think I continue to try to do uh, that. Sometimes there are some sculptures that I really try to see if I could reinterpret them. Uh, not because I, that's the first thing I think of, but because somehow the, the idea of the artwork renders itself into, into those pieces. So the awareness of, of what the previous artists have done before, um, which I think what, there's something about this exhibition, Sean, that has been um, interesting to me, and, and the reason why I also agreed to, uh, to have this conversation was because I have been away for uh, uh, more than, for about five years, and there's a disconnection that I've had with home. And, with also the artists that I learned about, I was aware of, but having been in the US and having been in a space where there's just so much um, of like relearning and, and, and you know, it's a place that also, re sell, uh, that's provincial, that references itself, it thinks, it's, it thinks of itself as the center of the world. Um, it's, been, it's been quite a, a struggle to assert one's, one's voice in and to talk about artists that no one ever heard of, let alone you, um, was something I kind of struggled with in the beginning, and I think I still do. Uh, so I was finding myself having to know their history while I was getting to know their scene and trying to find my, my, my space in. Uh, but now I think I'm at a space where I think I think this type of exhibition, me agreeing to, to have this conversation and sort of uh, set myself off the journey to, to, to look through the archive, relearn, and, and see, because it, it really is that I see even my own, my own writing about my, my work in the US, it's, you know, there's, there's this thing that is very strange even to me that, you know, that puzzles me sometimes as well, but um, you know this 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 exotic other ring um, that cannot be known, um, but we want to consume these images that that you know have, you know they they compelling in a way I guess. Um, so I think I'm at a period where I'm also kind of looking back and trying to find myself back home and seeing w w what artists. Uh, really actually influenced me in the, in the work that I do, and also like which people I can continue pulling within my community in, in a place that is, is, is uh, self-referential, provincial, uh, and say, you know, like, it's fine, I can have a dialogue that no one understands, but I could also bring, you know, you know artists that we've also forgotten about with. I mean, you're in a unique position because you spend much of your time in Los Angeles. Uh, you've been there roughly five years. If one thinks particularly in the last, 
you know, one could date it to the murder of George Floyd, but I think a little earlier um, there was a sudden awareness. And when I speak about segregated art histories, it's not only unique to South Africa. The United States has it too. Not, it's not past tense. And there's also been a reckoning there with a kind of a tradition that wasn't fully acknowledged in the largely white art world there. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of people like Buford Delaney, Alma Thomas. You know, everyone talks about Kerry James Marshall or some of the, the living artists, but there's, their careers were built on other major artists. Yeah. You know, and Delaney his, was like way earlier yeah. in, in the conversations around figurative uh, painting. Uh, Have you noticed, where, you know, because I, for instance, wrote about Buford Delaney. If you don't know him, he's a remarkable artist worth looking to. Uh, he was a great friend of James Baldwin. James Baldwin wrote a lot about him. He was profiled in Life magazine in the 50s. He left uh, the United States for exactly the same reason as James Baldwin, moved to France, and was buried in a pauper's grave in Paris, a very kind of inglorious end. And it's only recently that his uh, legacy has been uh, reclaimed. But I mean, in, the reason I bring this up is that you are in the United States, and you must be watching some of this going on with some interest. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, of course, like, I think this, this is kind of going back to, uh, to what I just said, to that seeing that there's, there's, so there's, there's something about, um, this conversation that you are pulling out into this show that I think is, is, is a starting point um, and a lot more work that needs to be done. And I think I see, I see some examples from within the US that, you know, that compel me also, and, I, and especially being there at this time, that I think I wanted, I wanted to see if I, I could continue cultivating the same. Um, or like just also just for myself um, and, and, and learning more about uh, my own history, which I don't know much about myself. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's like, okay, that, that is a conversation that's, that's important too. Okay. I've got one last thing and then I'll throw it open to the floor. One of the reasons I love the painters here is that they kind of break the rules of, um, let's say, a kind of highly formalist uh, art history. I'm thinking of people like art historians like Michael Fried, who write about theatricality being the death of art, or all the debates around kitsch or sentimentality in art. And if you look at those Setembiso Subisis, they're highly theatrical, but he uses these, uh, let's say, I wouldn't call them rules of practice, but sort of prescriptions, and tweaks them. If you look at those two um, pembers of the police raid, they're almost like stage sets for a soap opera. And, you know, there's a number of his paintings that are like that. That one's called Police Raid, but he has the prodigal son, of which he produced numerous. The same table, a person sitting there, the father welcoming the son. There's another kind of genre piece where the husband is being sent off to the city to go work. They're highly sentimental. In a certain version of art history, sentimentality is to be condemned and judged. I find in, in a lot of the work here that those qualities are exactly the things that give the work their energy. And, you know, if we jump across to your paintings, your colors are outrageous. <laughs> I haven't been told that, but, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. I'd we don't have to talk it. We can, do it. We, I'm throwing it open, or if you want to shout back at me. Uh, okay, so I, I guess I have, I have a, uh, I must have You have the question. last laugh, so you can say what you want. Okay, so I, I guess within this conversation of like, you did address this, um, and I guess it's a little bit of an unfair question, but I think uh, 
we spoke, you mentioned it, you spoke about it yesterday, that um, how do you feel about being a white male artist um, looking at these black artists and sort of bringing them up into this conversation right now? Um, you said, you did say this actually really very clearly earlier, uh, but there's a lot of this, of this, uh, of these questions right now, like um, who speaks for who, um, and and why does it matter? It's I don't an, know. If it's, it's an important question. I don't know how to answer it. There's there's versions of answers you can give, and um, they sort of just touch on a truth. They're not. they not. They are not the truth. So, one of them is. Um, Thelma Golden, who's a very influential and important curator, um, who introduced many of the important figures, uh, Glenn Ligon, Fro Fred Wilson, Lorna Simpson. Um, less remarked on is an exhibition she did on black romanticism, and showing what would be, I suppose, called more ho homespun paintings, more sentimental paintings. And I'll just quote the word that she uses, that these are distinct, audacious, difficult, and discontinuous uh, paintings, works that are irredeemable in the eyes of so-called high culture because they're kind of sentimental, because they flirt with kitsch. And when I read that, I was like, huh, there's, you know, these rules that you are taught for looking and appreciating are not always fixed truths, they're merely ways that can help you see. And sometimes the opposite is true. Um, that was one, in, in realizing that the struggle to particularly sometimes come to terms with this highly figurative work that is didactic and moral, it's not just a struggle about race, it's also a struggle about class and taste. Um, that's not the full answer. Is it my place? I'm still, that, that question will travel with me. I, I can't answer it. I do think it's important that we somehow stage these conversations and also allow uh, interest across divides. I think, you know, if, if we merely repeat a segregated art history and always praise the same artists, you know, I found that this exhibition was a great, uh, what's the simplest word? It was like letting out air, uh, <sighs> that feeling, because prior to doing this, I'd written the biography of Irma Stern. And one of the, <laughs> the overriding feelings was in relooking the press archive was, oh my God. If you read the, the Irma Stern Press Archive, it's His Excellency Mr. So-and-so opened her exhibition from 1940 till 1966. There was this kind of predictable drone, and there were these posh ladies with nice hats. And somehow, coming here, I didn't, I didn't it wasn't, I, you know, it was an escape from that world, which is partly what the art world's about. Uh, and these, these are these. I, I mean, of course, these these artists had all of them. They had like such a difficult um, artistic hustle or life um, in their lifetime, um, which is quite very opposite to Emma Stern, like completely on the opposite. And of course, there's the political context. Yeah, and I suppose you know the the one thing that I've had to admit is I'm a liberal. I'm not a radical, and I believe there's points of reconciliation in the grand tradition of liberalism, and I think our art history can find them. And here's an example. George Pember in 1944 gets a grant to travel across the country, and this is important. George Pember never left South Africa. It was his one great desire. He admired French modernism and uh, English narrative painting from the 19th century, but he never got to travel. So in 44, he gets a grant to travel around the country, and he goes to Craddock, he goes to Johannesburg, he goes to Durban, but 
a key experience for him is just south of Durban in a small village where he says for a moment he could not be himself. It was a different Pemba that he encountered. And it's in a way that sort of idealized scene there um, because he was an urban-born artist and he had a, a difficult relationship to what his heritage was, what the distinction between city and country was. Interestingly enough, that happened in 44, 1922. Um, Irma Stern has her first exhibition in Cape Town it gets savaged, and she goes on a trip to Umgababa, which is just south of Durban, and finds her subject, a kind of rural fantasy. She's a highly metropolitan artist trained in Berlin. Is that a reconciliation? Maybe not, but there's point of intersection that I think we should always at least allow in thinking about our art history. Cool. That's fair, that's fair. I will Okay, can we up. open it up? Or we can have drinks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, thank you so much um, for putting up. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much, Sean, for putting up such a beautiful exhibition and um, Simpiwe for giving us insight into your journey. I actually was at your graduate show, so it's really cool. Um, so anyway, my question is, um, um, Sean, you, and this to both of you, but at the beginning, Sean, you mentioned um, something along the lines of um, we should be suspect of um, using language like social realism. Um, and even though people like George Pember didn't leave the country, there are similarities and connections that are regional. So you'll see similar styles, genres, um, issues, concerns with artists, contemporaries in um, Zimbabwe, Namibia, elsewhere. So I guess, like, what for, and this is for both of you, like, how do we articulate, place, write about artists from this, these moments if we need to find new ways of describing what they are doing. Because at some point, we do need to write about them. Um, and also, is social, is this genre, um, is there a link between uh, figurative painting or the, 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 what do you call it? Is there a link between figurative painting and, um, I don't want to say the rise of it, but more insight into it with social politics? Do you want to go or must I go? Uh, let's see if I can try to speak to the definitions. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think labeling um, is always a way of trying to, I guess it, it, in, in, some, in some way, we always try to ascribe uh, meaning and then out of meaning we, we find that we have to have definitions, uh, which is something that artists always try to run away from. Of course, like I'm, I'm not an African artist. I'm not a realist. I, you know, I, I, I uh, probably not even an artist. Who knows? Uh, but it's. I think it's. It's always an interesting conversation, um, and something that has to remain a point of contestation in a way. Uh, and, and maybe questioned all, all the time. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the one reason why I we said we should be suspicious of um, these category terms is these are not photographs. I mean, that's kind of self-evident. But there's a certain history of speaking about black figurative painting in this country that treats it as a kind of sociological demonstration of what life was like. And you know that's no coincidence, because if you look at some of the early art history, some of George Pember's promoters, like uh, De Jager, at Forte University wasn't an art historian. Um, they were in African studies. And there was 
a kind of utilization of the pictures to demonstrate what segregated life was like. I'm sure many of these scenes correspond with elements of what lived reality was like, but it's important to understand that these are also painted objects. And you know, if George Pember is saying his greatest discovery as an artist is not the figure, it's color and what color can do. Um, it's a discovery of a material element of painting. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a fairly simple insight. These are not um, documentary images of a time. They're interpretations and translations. And in interpretation and translation, things are lost and things are gained. Um, does that answer? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think of in the same way they, um, so Josh Pember is, is, is sort of like, was, was uh, given the label of like a, a true, someone who is depic depicting the true uh, life of people in, in Eastern Cape, um, and therefore was given the label of being a, um, a, a township realist, for instance, and how much of that definition affected his uh, uh, the way he was valued or viewed or written about, um, and the limitations of those this uh, I guess the the the, the labeling in in a way, um, especially if they were not uh, interrogated. <clears throat> and now Josh Pamba remains like very still. Uh, Almost having to be rescued out of those conversations for for you know why is George Pember not given um, uh, the same the same attention or valued in the same way as much as his contemporaries as were having this conversation mm -hmm. yesterday uh, as a supporter uh, for instance um, and 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 what needs to happen for 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 these historical um, artists who's very very important actually. Um, to be written about in a different way. So it's important where I started to give thanks, and again to give thanks to the three artists who are not here, and the living artist who is here, and Pia, thank you so much for doing this. It's, um, I think it's a very important conversation that, that we had. It's very different from a walkabout where you hear one person saying this was my intention, look at these. Um, I think, you know, in this sort of tussle, things uh, get half said, and when you leave, you wish you said something else or more or didn't say something. But that's, you know, part of what a, a public dialogue's about. I want to thank Owen because this, as I said, I'm not a curator, and um, I was very nervous in anticipation of this. I'm also very aware that I've mostly looked at Tanzani and the roles are reversed and I'm looking at Koya, the surly journalist, <laughs> and now everyone's looking at me. <laughs> it's a good lesson in humility. Um, you know, I reviewed uh, some Pewe's first show for Art Forum when, and you did the walkabout at um, What If the World Gallery. And we've walked a, a long journey. I actually was digging through my phone and found that I took notes from that walkabout. And one of the things you said, your work is figurative, but it's not about identity. It's about something else. Mm -hmm. And in a way, your career has played out what that something else is. Even though at that time you were making, you were working between kind of applied painting, you were painting on photographs, you were still sort of working through Kendall Gears, for instance, with those bricks that you made. Um, and you had, that, you had that big work that traveled to Mexico, which actually was a group portrait, all those stick figures. Um, and, you know, again, I, I'm repeating myself, but the art world we sometimes forget is incredibly small, and it's worth celebrating the smallness and the intimacy and the connections. From Piwe to Trevor to George, it's very direct. It's not something that's bookish. It's like a lived reality. Um, a last thanks, Claire at the back, who really helped me in putting this together. And, you know, the one thing that I learned is an exhibition doesn't happen through someone talking. 
There's people putting stuff up on the walls. And um, Norval has a fantastic team that makes it possible. So I think, you know, if any thanks are due, it's to Norval, to Owen, to Claire, to everyone that made it possible, and to the lenders. It's not all exclusively work from uh, the Norval collection. There's a work from, two works from Sunlam. Thanks, Stefan. There's two works from Element House. There's some private collect collections here. Um, take in this last opportunity before you have a drink. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>